Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Research Saturday, presented by Juniper Networks. I'm Dave Bittner, and this is our weekly conversation with researchers and analysts, tracking down threats and vulnerabilities, and solving some of the hard problems of protecting ourselves in a rapidly evolving cyberspace. Thanks for joining us. And now a word about our sponsor, Juniper Networks. Organizations are constantly evolving and increasingly turning to multi-cloud to transform IT. Juniper's connected security gives organizations the ability to safeguard users, applications, and infrastructure by extending security to all points of connection across the network. Helping defend you against advanced threats, Juniper's connected security is also open so you can build on the security solutions and infrastructure you already have. Secure your entire business from your endpoints to your edge and every cloud in between with Juniper's connected security. Connect with Juniper on Twitter or Facebook. And we thank Juniper for making it possible to bring you Research Saturday. And thanks also to our sponsor, Enveil, whose revolutionary zero-reveal solution closes the last gap in data security, protecting data in use. It's the industry's first and only scalable commercial solution enabling data to remain encrypted throughout the entire processing life cycle. Imagine being able to analyze, search, and perform calculations on sensitive data all without ever decrypting anything, all without the risks of theft or inadvertent exposure. What was once only theoretical is now possible with Enveil. Learn more at Enveil.com. So Nukibi, the story was we first encountered it when we were doing our research into Gantcraft. That's John Fokker. He's head of cyber investigations for McAfee Advanced Threat Research. The research we're discussing today is titled McAfee ATR Analyzes So Dinokibi, aka Our Evil Ransomware as a Service, What the Code Tells Us. That was another ransomware version, very prolific in 2018, halfway 2019. And at the end of GangCrab, we start to see some strange things in the affiliate structure that people were missing. So we're like, where are the big players? Where do they go? And at that time, actually, one of our industry peers, I, th- I think it was Cisco, they reported on Soda Kibi. They were using the WebLogic vulnerability. And it caught our attention. So it's like, that's interesting. They're doing some pretty sophisticated stuff and they're hitting targets. And we were also in contact with other industry peers and other companies doing IR and incident response. And the name kept popping up. Actually, I uh, had some trouble pronouncing the name the first week when I encountered it. <laughs> I think everybody does. And the, well, the, I, the I, name I'm was, familiar with that, yes. Yeah, the name is in the, um, in the executable and it's the actors themselves call it re-evil or uh, re-evil from Resident Evil. That's mm. what we think. But uh, that's when it first popped up, I think a couple of months, maybe, yeah, a couple of months after or shortly after Gangcrab died down, it really came up. And then it popped the headline news that it was targeting MSPs, managed service providers. And then it really caught our attention. We're like, well, we need to do some better and some digging deeper into this because it has similarities to gang care, but we saw what is going on. We, we were curious to see what was behind Sono Kiwi. Let's describe what we're talking about here. What is the, the basic uh, functionality and purpose of Sodino Kiwi? Well, it's ransomware. And the basic purpose is extortion. So They are hunting for victims, infecting victims, and what they do a little bit differently from the -the run-of-the-mill is that they try to infect a lot of victims within one network. So one of their specific targets, as I mentioned before, are MSPs, managed service providers. So they will try to go after a managed service provider, try to infect the managed service provider completely. They can do that using legitimate tools or pen test tools that you see. And when they've gained full control, through the managed service provider, they try to reach out to their customers as well. So you have one node to many nodes, and then they infect them all at once. And by doing so, they get a really, really large victim base, and they have to pay up a big amount. Either the victims pay themselves, or yeah, they're, they're evil enough. They also offer a price to the MSP, which is uh, much and much higher, mostly a tenfold higher to get their their data back. And they know who they are infecting. So they have knowledge of the victims to a certain extent. 
And what are you tracking here in terms of who they're targeting? Does it seem like they're focusing on anyone in particular? We've seen all things across the board from, as you might have seen in the headline news in Texas municipalities, all the way to uh, MSP that's catering to dentist practices. But on the other end of the scale, and that's what we wrote about in one of our blogs, we also run a network of honeypots and they managed to infect our honeypots as well. That's that's also one of the reasons why it well, got our attention. Uh, and these honeypots had a RDP weakness in them. So you were able to break in with uh, brute forcing the RDP credentials. And we saw certain TV being dropped on that as well. Well, let's walk through it together. There's a section here in your research about reversing the code. Can you take us through step by step what's going on? There's a lot of similarity to a lot of other ransomware versions. So they do the language check and they check for uh, certain languages. And if that language pack is installed or that keyboard setting is installed, for instance, former Soviet Union countries, we call them CIS countries, they wouldn't encrypt that system. Interesting enough that Sony Kibi also has Romanian or the Moldovan language pack, which is currently used a lot in Romania as well, as well as Iran and Syria. In Syria, we saw with uh, Gancrab and Iran is also interesting. We believe that it has to do with the affiliates that they can select. Well, I, I don't want my sample to encrypt any of my fellow countrymen, that's probably to evade prosecution. And when mm. it done so, all the, the checks and balances, it will drop the virus. It's interesting that we could also saw that they, they pulled down PowerShell code. They have all kinds of methodologies. We've seen several things, and they would lock down your whole system. And they're relatively quick in doing so, too. When they start to encrypt it, they build a configuration file. And that configuration file it has all the details for the virus. And that configuration file, we will be able to extract and we can get some other telemetry from it. And it will tell you like, okay, what files to exclude? What are the command and control server addresses to reach out to? What is the affiliate ID? What's the campaign ID? And things like that. When we compare it, it has um, to Gancrab, because that was the, the other competitor. And we see similarity to the way URLs are generated. And that has a very, very similar function, almost identical to the one that's in gang crabs. That was for us a, an interesting observation, too. Yeah, is, is the notion here that perhaps the folks who developed this had access to the source code for Gantt crab? Yeah, you phrased it absolutely right. There's a lot of speculation going on w between all the vendors because everybody wants to state it. And, and I understand it. And from McAfee, and I have to say, this is we've done extensive research, the whole team. We toned down this, and you stated it absolutely correct. There are functions within Sonokibi that show a high similarity with Gancrab, and that could indicate that at some point they had either access to the source code, which uh, could be the case, or some people will go to say they're former developers, but we don't have all those answers. But based on that, we do think that there has been some kind of sharing will be indicating voluntarily, but that there is a code overlap. So at some point in time, they have to have access to portions of the code of Gancrab. It also has the functionality that it can work as a wiper. Yes, that is a function you could program in your config file and then it wipes stuff. But that it's detrimental to the whole ransomware campaign because Sony Kiwi actually is proud for the fact that their decryptor works, works really well. So if you wipe stuff, you won't get it back. And right. that's, that's not in interest of the actor, but it, it could hint on destructive purposes. So you could repurpose Sony Kiwi for even more evil deeds. But the indication that we have seen, it's mostly focused on financials. So they will always have a possibility to get your files back. And they're proud of that too, because of all the ransomwares that a crypto doesn't work right. I think the last time we spoke, we spoke about Riot, that they had a lot of mistakes in it. And so mm -hmm. he is actually proud, like, hey, if you pay us, you'll get your files back. We have 100% or near 100% guarantee of uh, decryption. It's interesting to think about the criminals hanging their hat on that, taking pride in uh, their work in that sort of way. It is a very interesting dynamic, yes. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of, of the encryption itself, then, what's going on under the hood and what, in your estimation, is the level of sophistication that they're using here? Under the hood, it's very solid. We've been looking at Gancrab for a while. That was quite solid as well. We actually managed to build several vaccines. And for Gancrab, there were several decryptors. They're 
ransomware, their use of encryption, they know what they're doing. It's powerful. We haven't found any flaws yet. And there's no public decryptors out there. So th- they know their stuff. They're, they're, they're good in that case. And what are they doing in terms of obfuscation and hiding themselves as they're going about their business? Well, it has several functions to do that. One of the interesting things is that it downloads the actual payload. We see it going back to a pastebin site. So it doesn't even, when you get infected first, it doesn't directly get delivered on your system, but you your computer beacons out to a pastebin site and pulls down the code from there. It has some privilege escalation techniques. It has several other functions. One of the privilege escalation techniques is CVE 2018-8453, Heaven's Gate. They're, they're really on point. They do some pretty good stuff. And, and and I'm not the most technical one, I have to admit. One we have that's why it's a team effort. Our team is mm-hmm. we have some really talented reverses and he's a, and he as well is so like, wow, I've looked at Gankrab and at other ransomware, but these these guys know what they're doing. They, they, they obfuscate strings inside their malware, all kinds of little tricks just to make it a little bit harder for our own uh, reversers. And in terms of people protecting themselves against this, what are your recommendations? I would suggest getting a good AV. We do see that RDP is heavily targeted. So make sure your RDP access, if you have it, is locked down or no access. Make sure you update and patch it that you're not vulnerable to the latest exploit, uh, the CVE 2019, was it, I think 0708 or the, the, the Blue Keep uh, vulnerability. I'm doing it just on the top of my head. Mm-hmm. And if you have uh, managed service providers, because they most predominantly target businesses, have that frank discussion with your MSP and, and say, hey, how are you accessing my network? Are you using multi-factor authentication? Or are you just jumping in on a high-privileged account? These are things that I think are very important. to Take a close look at the people who you trust within your network, within your organization, or who you work with, your suppliers, and see if they're, if how their security system is set up. And backups, obviously backups. And predominantly off-site when you have them, and have some backups not connected to the network, and the most essential stuff that you have to run your business back that up and store it because these actors, they know where to look. If you have backups that are connected to the network, they know where to find that. Do you have any sense for the growth of this? In other words, is the proliferation of Sotinakibi increasing or are they they staying about the same? Are they decreasing? How successful do you suppose they are? They're very successful. In one of our other blocks, we traced the income of a couple of actors, affiliates who openly stated that they're working for a new ransomware version, and we linked two and two together that it has to be so in Kiwi. That is scary. It's about $300,000 in one weekend. And one of the actors had a, well, I can call it like a cold store, or his, his ransomware savings, and that was uh, exceeding uh, $4.5 million. So, so we're dealing with people with deep pockets. That's a scary, scary thoughts that they have that, that type of stuff. And, it, and it's not slowing down. I look at the actors on the forums and sometimes they say, well, okay, the developers might say, well, we'll take a break or we need new people to join our program. But judging and speaking to my industry peers, we see it come back and come back. And it's, and it's often in the headlines. And that's the, the, that's the worrisome thought that it's, uh, they're successful at what they do. Yeah, it's interesting to me that how ransomware has become sort of part of the ecosystem. It doesn't seem like it's going anywhere. No, no. Extortion is uh, one of the oldest crimes. And I think one of the earliest forms of ransomware, they actually made you uh, do a money transfer or wire transfer to a bank account in Panama. I think that was with the AIDS ransomware. With the Bitcoin coming, we had the first affiliate programs with Crypto Wall and CTB Locker and and, and now we see that there's more, there's, with Sam Sam, the more targeted attacks are coming. And we're dealing with a maturity curve with the actors that are, they used to be that the, the actors trying to spread out the ransomware are not the most sophisticated, but we see a maturity curve of them as well. And they're getting better and better. They're using exploits for uh, remote management software to infect complete networks and systems. They have RDP cracking crews, as we call them. So they outsource the, the labor to other people who en masse try to break in computer systems by brute forcing RDP credentials. And from there, they, they actually act as a, a legitimate pen testing team, almost. Like I, I run a red team within McAfee and and they do they launch similar techniques and they use similar tools as, as my team does. 
in just in order to get a better field and network, get all the high privileged accounts, get complete control. And when they have that control, then they can launch their attack. So it is evolving. It's scary. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm worried where it's going. Yeah. Well, as you look towards the horizon, uh, what, what do you see? Where, where do you suspect we are going? If you look at the horizon right now, we see from where we have the spray and pray attacks, where there's one system infected, now they're going to a whole network. The attention on local government and on corporate networks, I think in the short term or near future, I think an additional thing would be that they would try to milk that network even more. So before encrypting it, exfiltrating data, then encrypting it. And then later on, if it's sensitive information or it's information at the end of the quarter, turn back to the company and say, like, hey, we've got this sensitive information for you. We stole this and we want to disclose this. So you have to pay us again, something like that. Mm -hmm. Or because they are on a network and they're exposed to a lot of sensitive and maybe personal data, use and harvest credit cards of other. And that's already happening on a smaller scale with other ransomware versions as well. Harvest credit card credentials and all these things from the users on the network. So you could be an employee and then all of a sudden you get a fraud charge in your card. And then two days or three days later, certain TV hits, for instance. I think that's, that's the stuff we might be seeing in the future. Our thanks to John Fokker from McAfee for joining us. The research is titled McAfee ATR Analyzes So Dinokibi, a.k.a. Our Evil Ransomware as a Service, What the Code Tells Us. We'll have a link in the show notes. Thanks to Juniper Networks for sponsoring our show. You can learn more at juniper.net slash security or connect with them on Twitter or Facebook. And thanks to Envale for their sponsorship. You can find out how they're closing the last gap in data security at envale.com. The CyberWire Research Saturday is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. The coordinating producer is Jennifer Iben. Our amazing CyberWire team is Stefan Vaziri, Kelsey Bond, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Nick Vilecki, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. 